Excellent. Okay. So we might set some kind of speed record today. This was a 20-minute presentation, and a bunch of it might be stunningly boring. So we may sort of gloss over some of those parts to get to the, the cooler stuff. Uh, it's the high throughput parallel molecular dynamics. How do we come up with that name? It's um, the starting point is high throughput computing, so uh, we're using a lot of Condor and its related friends to do um, computation. And we engaged a molecular dynamics researcher. And there's also the parallel part, so one of the things that we're doing right now is high throughput parallel computing. It used to be that high throughput computing was relegated to serial jobs, lots of serial jobs. And now with the advent of multi-core, uh, it's increasingly interesting to run jobs on whole machines where you can take over, in the case of Blue Ridge, eight cores. And we were also seeing things like 32-core uh, machines coming out. And I suspect that those numbers will continue to get bigger. So this is a story of a first user in molecular dynamics, what we did to get uh, her up and running, and then some of the bigger challenges that we're looking at. As far as high throughput parallel computing, I've touched on that a little bit. Uh, the main theme is that there are these multi-core machines out there, and this project, HTPC, is investigating what you need to do to get that to happen. So there's uh, specific text that needs to go with every job submission to tell the cluster that it's landing on to give it the whole machine. And there are complexities surrounding MPI about how you compile the job and how you compile the MPI libraries and deliver those to the machine. And so that's uh, well underway. We know how to do that now, which is different than a year ago when we didn't. Uh, here's a, a little brief overview of molecular dynamics. The second quote is by far the more interesting one. Um, Everything that living things do can be understood in terms of their jiggling and wiggling of atoms. Let's see which is kind of interesting. And so another piece we'll have to understand to get into this is AMBER. Uh, AMBER is a suite of tools, but the one we like most is PMMD because it's so fast. And it's uh, heavily dependent on MPI, and it does the uh, molecular dynamics math to simulate the motion of atoms in a big molecule, for example. So it's uh, pretty widely used, as far as that goes. And our first researcher, Laura Parasinati, uh, was using PMMD to look at a couple of things. Um, this attractive molecule here that I won't attempt to speak to in great detail, and how it jiggles and wiggles. And um, much of the work that she's doing is, is pretty fine grain. She's looking at a, a relatively small set of atoms, which is probably the primary driver to the complexity of a molecular dynamics simulation. Number of atoms and um, period of the simulation, number of nanoseconds that you're, that you're doing. And that'll become relevant as we look at some of the, the future challenges. <coughs> so, yeah, sure. Yeah. We are looking at, uh, let's see, the one on the left is dihydrofolate reductase. And a whole lot more than that I won't be able to tell you. Uh, but yes, there's a binding site that we're looking at in here. right? So she's trying to figure out uh, what the positions of these atoms need to be for the binding to occur. So I only play a doctor on TV. Like, yes, I'm sure that you know. To, to many of the things that you said, there's some underlying physics. Yes, what the underlying physics would be, I would not be able to to speak to that. So, yes, and that's what Amber does. So PMMD is is the uh, the piece of Amber that models all of those rules. Okay. Yep. Go for it.
So I think it depends on what you mean by internally, because I think I'm about to name the person who can do the best job uh, I can imagine of, of doing that. If what you mean is molecular dynamics, okay? Yeah, okay. So we're working with a researcher over at UNC who is uh, the molecular dynamics person for many different bio projects. And I've had her give me an overview of what these apps are doing. Um, she knows a great deal more about it than I do. Depends on what level of physics you're interested in. Sure, it's, it's Brenda Temple. Um, wow, that's a pile of people. There you go. <laughs> okay, so uh, having said that, the brownish boxes in the middle here, those are the, the codes that we're going to run. So Amber P. MemD is the one that models all these uh, physics rules we're talking about. The two boxes below it are the MPI libraries that it depends on to run. All of those have been statically compiled, so they don't have no dependencies that aren't going to be found on the, on the machine they target. And then there's some sort of script wrappers around it that we'll talk about a little bit more in a second. All right. Why did I draw the boxes that way? I'm not sure which particular thing you're talking about. Yeah, you know, that's that should have just been done differently. That's the job, meaning the thing that's going to execute, and this was referring to some infrastructure that manages jobs. Okay, so this should have had a longer name that didn't fit in that much uh, that amount of box. So, all right. So in this diagram, we're looking at a wrapper on the outside that does the the meta stuff related to a job. It it gets data uh, pulled over to the site where the job's going to execute. It gets data sent back and um, does wrapper kinds of things, okay? And the part, yeah, sure. The green stuff on the inside. Right, so all this stuff that's not labeled in here is the experiment. So this is the part that the researcher uh, thinks about, cares about, wants to understand, and this part is not really value added for the researcher, right? This is not uh, chemistry. This is just stuff to get data to places and get it back to places. And this is the, the flip side of that, right? So the, um, the job, <laughs> the internals are the experiment. What is the simulation we're trying to execute? How many nanoseconds is it gonna run? That sort of business. And there's some, um, some composition in this container to keep the researcher working at the, at the level of their problem so that they don't have to think about MPI, for example. Just some stats on what Laura's outcomes were. Um, she got her work done, it was faster. She reports a, a four to eight time speed up using OSG and uh, this approach. So um, the shortcomings, right. Uh, Amber is ported to GPUs, and it's a lot faster on GPUs. So really, as neat as this is, a GPU-based AMBER system is going gonna, is gonna to blow it out of the water. It's also not modular, so there are a lot of uh, very big scripts that do one thing, and uh, we'll see in a second why I think that's not the best way to do it. So moving right along, Brenda, who I just mentioned a minute ago, works with um, probably a half a dozen or more researchers at UNC doing molecular dynamics kinds of things. And yeah, we spoke for a while on what the problems were that she was facing and split the world up into some small problems down at that end and some bigger ones. Uh, the Sondek lab is doing some things with Rode GTP that currently run in 128-way uh, jobs. It's going to take her um, four or five months, I believe, to get the, the duration of simulation that she needs to get done. So 200 nanoseconds of simulation, you can do the math there. Also, because she's got 128-way jobs running on top sale, Running in the HTPC model on OSG was not that exciting to her. HTPC um, is looking at basically splitting jobs into eight-way jobs. So that's sort of the wrong direction in, in certain ways. But she kindly continued talking to us, and we'll, we'll see how that turned out. Um, so what they're studying is the way that Rho GTP interacts with a cell membrane and grabs this thing called PLC data. And uh, there's a piece of 
protein, this linker object right here. When the linker is down, it connects with the membrane and does the thing that it's supposed to do, and we don't get sick, right? When the linker is in the way, it doesn't connect with the membrane, and everything goes to heck. Okay. So, um, right, the, it's not super clear, but the blue over on the far left there is the starting position of the linker. The green is its second position, and in the red, it's folded down on top of the surface of the protein, which is uh, blocking the uh, reaction. So lots of details here, but the upshot is that that uh, four-month simulation is modeling uh, one mutant. It's, it's one very narrow slice of the overall problem that they're trying to discover, right? This protein can move in a lot of different ways, and it's taking us five months to look at one of those variants. So what we're looking at is a lot more permutations in the future and the need to run it on different platforms like GPUs. Um, so that's what that slide says. So let's talk about GPUs for just a second. Uh, we ran some parts of this simulation on Blue Ridge. We've got a handful of uh, Teslas, which have something like 240 cores. The Fermis that are out now have 512 cores. So that's a level of parallelism that's a lot greater than you'll see with, um, with the CPU-based systems at the current time. And this is the a rough overview of the performance difference. So uh, what do we have here? 192 quad-core CPUs um, taking, yeah, go ahead, going at about 46 nanoseconds a day. And eight Fermis doing 52 nanoseconds a day. So that's a pretty big difference. And these results are from NVIDIA, but uh, the results that I got running QMMD on Blue Ridge are, are pretty similar. Alrighty, so Pegasus is a workflow management system that lets you represent a workflow in a way that's very abstract. So it, it talks very little about the actual underlying computational infrastructure, which cluster you're gonna run it on, things like that. So that's good and it integrates with Condor and a lot of the other tools that we use in OSD. And so we started to look at those two tools as ways that we could help Brenda get um, some additional benefit that she's not experiencing running on Topsail right now, okay? So she does have a workflow problem, she doesn't have workflow tools, and she does run QMMD but doesn't have GPUs. So what can we do about that? Here I'll add that the workflow she's got um, is not is not monolithic in the sense that you don't just take the whole thing and run it on GPUs. There are some parts of it that have to be run on CPUs and other executions run on GPUs. So it's hybrid, it's, in, it's inherently hybrid. And that's not the way her scripts are currently set up. They, they tend to assume that the underlying computational infrastructure is a CPU. So we put together this stack, I've talked about all the pieces, but at the end of the day, uh, there's gonna be there's gonna be Pegasus, there's gonna be some, some GPU, some CPU stuff in there, and there's this new thing called Grayson that I'll talk about here for just a second. Uh, Grayson is a way to model a workflow. There's lots of ways to model workflows. Most of you probably know that. Um, many of them are like IDEs, like integrated development environments, where once you model it in this environment, that's the only place it can run. And so the, the graphical representations tend to be pretty tightly coupled to the where you're gonna run it in question. And then there are things like Swift and Pegasus that are very scalable, grid-scale workflow engines. They don't emphasize graphical representations, so you tend to end up with things that don't convey a lot of semantic information to anyone but the person that wrote it, okay? So Grayson takes a, a different approach. It uses a graphing tool that's just, it's good at making pretty graphs. That's all it does, which is nice because it's convenient to use and it makes things that you want to look at. And then it annotates the graph objects with JSON, which is a, uh, textual representation borrowed from JavaScript. It's now pervasive. You can get JSON libraries in any language, pretty much. So what you end up with is something very portable that is useful to look at, but it's also modular. So the jobs here can be broken up so that this first job on top, the red thing in the middle, is gonna run on a CPU. It has to run on a CPU. The other two jobs need to run on GPUs. So basically, it, uh, Grayson is gonna let you parameterize the jobs in a very specific granular way. Yep, sure. Right, so the, the swim lanes, there are four swim lanes, 
and they're labeled input, job, output, and executable. So all the orange stuff over here is an input file, okay? The yellow things are outputs of jobs, and the red things are jobs. So a job is an executable with a certain set of parameters doing something in particular. The executables over here are references to the idea of PMMD itself, the executable, the thing that's going to run. And uh, in the first go round here, we're parameterizing all of these things with, this is all the gore that you have to tell a job to get it to run on a GPU on Blue Ridge, right? So the, um, the work that OSG did to run on parallel machines gets that done, but it's not granular enough to talk about GPUs as it stands today, especially not at a job specific level. That's, that's a bit farther than we've gone. So all of this parameterization is attached to each one of the objects that we're pointing to, okay? And so the executable at the very top is gonna run on CPUs, so, so it doesn't have this GPU tag, all right? In this first go round, uh, if, you're, if you're thinking about portability, you might look at this and say, there's a problem, and you're right. Um, this doesn't get us where we wanna go because the workflow is still talking about the execution environment, okay? So I can't take this workflow with all the logic of which files go to which jobs and what the order is and move that somewhere else. Yes, I think it's, it's probably worth noting that there are different kinds of users. I think there's one kind of user that makes these models. Uh, Brenda currently does this right now, but she writes Bash instead, right? But I think there's another kind of user that doesn't exist now. So John Sondek doesn't read Brenda's scripts to find out what's happening, because he, it, it, that's not his, uh, his field, right? So I think there's a class of user that should be able to read these things that just doesn't exist currently. Uh, no, my hope is that she will switch to Grayson down the road, right? And, and the reason is, if she takes her script that runs on top sale right now and wants to run it on base to get the, the GPUs, she's going to have to do quite a bit of recoding and, and sort of granular retweaking re of that. Um, but if it were already in a model like this, we would be able to point it at a couple of different clusters, right? And, and the logic of it would remain intact. So there's Taverna, there's Kepler, there's um, Triana, and those are kind of, and there's Pegasus UI, and maybe Wings, okay? And those are all sort of on the um, IDE end of the spectrum, with the exception of Wings. Uh, so they're a soup to nuts system that's gonna draw your workflow and execute it. They have a lot of pre-built components that are, it's sort of a Lego approach uh, to it. And the goal here is different. I mean, they're both visual, and that's really similar. Uh, but apart from that, I think the goals are, are pretty separate. This should be able to target, eventually, different workflow management systems. So in principle, I can already run this on Pegasus. I should be able to run it on a different one as well. Because the representation is just of inputs to a job, outputs, and how they connect together. What's that? There is not. If by that you mean the Kepler style, very, very deep hierarchy of all the things that you can do in the world, there's no such thing here. Right, there's not. And um, this builds very heavily on what Pegasus does, um, which I, I like. I think it's very hard to do an ontology that anticipates all the things a person might want to do. That's just, that's tough. You know, when I think of like successful ontologies out there, um, there are so many, I think in part because so few of them work. But anyway. Yeah, I, that says it really well. I just, 
don't want to be building a thing to draw graphs. That's you know not something that we're awesome at, and we shouldn't be spending our time there. And uh, there are tools out there that draw graphs really well and use open standards, XML-based open standards, to exchange them. So kind of you know Taverna, Kepler, everybody comes up with Ptolemy or Mommel or um, uh, Scuffle or you know some brand new language to represent graphs, and I think that's a terrible choice. So. Uh, it's a state machine or a PetriNet. Yeah, so let's see. UML has activity diagrams and lots of other things, but this isn't trying to draw classes. It's trying to draw a process. So UML activity diagrams would be the closest thing, but then you'd have to use UML. Um, so do you have a question back there? Correct, and no, I haven't. Um, to visualize it, in what sense are you thinking? Like, well, I know the graph of Merle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Cytoscape or... Cytoscape? Yep. No. Not yet. Um, but I'm not I'm not sure I'm understanding the application of that properly. We would want to do that to create a node to do to do what? Oh, okay, I got you. Um, right, so you can certainly look at the metadata in the graphic tool now, but it is JSON. Yeah, so there there might be advantages to making it more graphical, but I just haven't I haven't really thought through what those would be right now.
it's almost hard to conceptualize right off what that would look like. Okay, I say that because there are plenty of workflow tools that have been used by folks here. There are some that I'm not sure they have been. Like Wings is an interesting one that uses RDF and OWL, uh, RDF at any rate, and is graphical. So it's a big space with a lot of stuff. So how do we get to the place where we can do that brown bag? Um, so that's, maybe that's what the workflow group is doing, but maybe not. Hijack away, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. Alrighty. Sure thing. No problem. Uh, so, let's see. This is just uh, pointing out that from that model, we generate a Pegasus DAX, and the DAX is the uh, XML based abstract Pegasus way of describing a workflow. And um, that's important because. I've been talking to the Pegasus folks, and I don't know that there's a way to represent the cluster-specific information about jobs while keeping the workflow abstract. So it's a design goal of Pegasus that this DAX talk about the workflow and not talk about the resources that you're going to execute it on. But the profile construct that you can't read at all right here, um, this is the way that you tell Pegasus to send RSL, to send a string to the cluster to tell it about GPUs, for example, to tell it about that level of information. And once you do that, it's Blue Ridge specific. Okay? So there are ways to use profiles that are not resource specific, but to get this particular thing done, we break abstraction in the workflow. If you use this to generate the DAX, you don't. Uh, because the workflow here is just the, the bits and pieces and how they communicate and what requires what. And then there's a separate file that talks about Blue Ridge specific stuff. The compiler munges them together and creates this DAX. Uh, so as far as where we have been, yeah, it's just on Blue Ridge at this point. Right, exactly. Obviously, that's not very satisfying. It needs to run lots of other places. We just haven't done that yet. Alrighty. So this is just an overview of things that Grayson does. A lot of them are uh, phrases that you'll recognize from other compiler type things. Uh, you can do references, which is neat, and separate compilation, which is going to be important. Uh, if you are going to be doing very big workflows and you can't do separate compilation, that's going to limit reuse. Because you'll have common chunks of the workflow that you have to repeat in a bunch of places. What you really want to do is build that piece of uh, the workflow, make it a, a thing in its own right, a workflow that can be then reused as a component and other things. We can do that. And you'll also want to be able to reference PMMD in the generic nucleosome workflow and say, on Blue Ridge, here's the nature of PMMD. Here are its attributes. And you do that with a reference. So the, uh, the cluster also has a reference to PMMD and decorates it and 
characterizes it with all sorts of properties and attributes. We can do that and uh, aggregate things and stuff like that. So those are some interesting features. Not yet, but that is the idea. So right now, it emits a Pegasus DAX. I have looked at Swift that much, <laughs> but and I'm when I'm, I can say I don't think we can do everything that Swift can do. Like I don't think you'll be able to take this model and address every Swift feature, but I don't think there's any reason that you couldn't take this and generate a Swift workflow. Um, you know, so th that's the model-driven idea behind it, right? Alrighty, so that thing over there is the characterization of Blue Ridge for the purposes of MPI. Um, and those little blue boxes on the right are the executables that are, are being told. Here's how you do MPI on Blue Ridge. Here's what you are. Here's what PMMD is on Blue Ridge. And this is just a um, quick overview of the actual process to go from that graphical thing to a running set of jobs. The first one invokes the compiler creates the DAX, and the second one takes the DAX and sends it out. So it's pretty, you know, pretty tight integration. And so from end to end, we create the graphical model in YED, which is the tool, and you uh, run the compiler in the step that we just saw. That sends it out to Pegasus via Condor, submits it through Globus to uh, Blue Ridge. PBS scheduler takes it. Some jobs get routed to GPUs, some jobs get routed to CPUs based on your model. And you watch it all with the Pegasus and, um, uh, monitoring tool. And that's, that's about the size of it. Yeah. Uh, right there. So this takes the workflow model and the cluster model, munges them together and creates a DAX. And I would say that's when it becomes concrete because there are cluster-specific references in it at that point, okay? But then Pegasus takes that and turns it into a Condor Dagman. Yep. Yes, so hmm, in the particular example we're looking at, we know we're going to hit Blue Ridge. But yeah, down the road, this needs to be opened up to target you know, via Condor, whatever the Condor pool has access to. So yes, there, there would be uh, potentially a, a further resource selection step. So all right, this is just sort of um, illegible. But those are the Teslas giving us their output, telling us what kinds of Teslas we ran on. And by way of conclusion, we've seen a lot of acronyms. Uh, so we're doing HTPC, high throughput parallel computing. We're addressing multi-core CPUs and, of course, GPUs that are inherently multi-core. And uh, doing so with Pegasus and this new thing, Grayson. You can find out lots more about it here. Um, any questions? <laughs> Uh, so hmm. she's generating workflows that produce the answer already. So at a real high level, I guess it's not that one. But she's not happy that it's taking five months to produce that answer and would rather it came back sooner. Um, on the second one, is she, what was it, lacking resources to create? Yeah, right. Yep. Yes. Not much. Right, exactly. Yes. 
so one problem that we haven't talked about that I think she has, we're still kind of chipping away at it to make sure, is she's got topsail, that's her pipe. Right? And so the throughput of topsail is her throughput. So if it takes five months to look at one slice of the question, what does the protein do when it's configured this way in this, in this mutant, then um, she might have six other questions that she's equally interested in, and they're just gonna have to wait. You know, So it would be nice if she had access to something like um, OSG, where you know, she could branch these things out to a lot of places and perhaps work on multiple problems simultaneously. Yeah, that's definitely changing. 